This is Criteria. Hey everyone, welcome back to Criteria. I'm Thomas Miris. I'm here with my co-host James Majewski. Hello, James. Hello, Thomas. Today we are discussing a film that we've we've intended to do for a while, and um, it was sort of moved up in the queue uh, by request uh, from our guest today, uh, who I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, but first, the film we're discussing today is Wise Blood, an adaptation of the first novel by Flannery O'Connor, directed by John Huston. Um, who made a lot of famous films, The Maltese Falcon, The African Queen, The Asphalt Jungle, many great films. Uh, and this is one of his later works, also is one of his most well-regarded, came out in 1979, starring Brad Dourif, a young, young Brad Dourif as the protagonist Hazel Motes. Sixty Buckley Road. You ain't no friend of hers, are you? I never saw her before. She don't usually have no preacher for company. I ain't a preacher. I, I only seen her name on in a toilet. Well, you look like a preacher. Your hat looks like a preacher's hat. It ain't. It's, it's just a hat. Well, it ain't only the hat. It's a look on your face somewhere. Look here, I ain't no preacher. Now, I understand it ain't anybody perfect on this green earth. Not preachers, not nobody. And you can tell folks better how terrible sin is if you know from your own experience. Listen, get this. There ain't but one thing that I want you to understand, and that's that I don't believe in anything. Nothing at all? Nothing. Well, that's the problem with you preachers. You've all got too damn good to believe in anything. Discussing this was the idea of our guest today, Katie Carl. Katie was was on here before to talk about um, Federico Fellini's Eight and a Half, and uh, she is oh, she's many things. She is the editor in chief of the Catholic Arts Journal Dappled Things. She's a novelist and short story writer. Um, she has a, a new collection of short stories out from Wise Blood Books, uh, shares the name of this film. The collection Fragile Objects, very enjoyable. I'm about halfway through it, probably, or a third of the way through it. Uh, Katie, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me on again. This is such a joy. Yeah. Uh, before we get to the film, do you want to say a word about your new collection? Uh, sure. Um, Fragile Objects is a collection of short stories um, that I put together over the last, I guess, the oldest thing in it dates from, I guess, 2008, but most of the pieces in it were written in the past four-ish years. So, um, yeah, no, it's a labor of love. It's a project, and, and part of it was my thesis for the um, Master of Fine Arts at the University of St. Thomas in fiction, which I just finished. So, um yeah, it's uh, it, it's been a real wild ride. Um, you know, I, I I could say I guess a lot more about the you know the process and the conditions, but that that's all like neither here nor there because we're here to discuss um, the fiction writer who really I think convinced me that you could be a Catholic and write serious fiction, um, who's Flannery mm. O'Connor. So um, if you read the stories, I think you see the influence. Um, although I do things differently, of course. Um, but but O'Connor's just so brilliant um and she's uh, she's such a complex figure but um her work is really such a gift uh to the world so um i'm really uh really delighted to be discussing a film based on um on her first novel which is uh oh, oh my gosh it's such an incredible piece of fiction i, I yeah i don't <laughs> want to get too far afield so <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, That's... Katie, no doubt you've read this book multiple times. I have read it once, and that was when I wrote a paper on it for a class in my freshman year of college almost 15 years ago. Uh, so it's been a little while. Uh, James, I think you said you started it at yeah. one point but never finished it. Yeah, I started it in a period of time where I was reading a lot of things, and so this was one of the many, many books that fell by the wayside and never, never to be picked back up. But uh, I guess you know it gives me never. the perspective of having um, watched this film you know, more or less uh, with a blank slate. So I don't know what that's worth, but that's what you're getting. Sure. 
Yeah, we'll that's that's good. Um, so yeah, let me say a couple things about this this film. Uh, this film was based on a screenplay by Benedict and Michael Fitzgerald, and these uh, these young men at the time had a Flannery O'Connor connection because they were the sons of Robert and Sally Fitzgerald, who were good friends um, of of Flannery. And uh, apparently I read that Benedict was even babysat by Flannery as a small child. I think that they um, they maybe uh, I don't know if she died when they were quite young or if they had, I know they moved to Italy and sort of were, were brought up in Italy later on. So I don't know that they knew her much longer than early childhood, but there's an interesting connection there. Um, I understand that the you know, she was staying with the Fitzgeralds at one point during the writing of this book. And so. Um, maybe there, the Fitzgeralds had some influence on, on this work. I mean, I, I, for example, I read that, um, Robert Fitzgerald has had translated Oedipus Rex and that when she was, she was reading that for the first time and was sort of like amazed and that, that affected her, her writing or rewriting of parts of the novel. Um, hmm. uh, and a bit more about Benedict Fitzgerald, really interesting. I didn't know this at all before researching this film. He co-wrote, went on later to co-write The Passion of the Christ with Mel Gibson. So, I mean, that's a quite interesting connection between this kind of uh, little known to the general public public art house film based, but based on a famous Catholic novel um, and, you know, the most famous, you know, Catholic film there is, right? Um and uh, I'll also say Sally Fitzgerald, uh, Benedict's mother, was the costume designer on this film. Um, a different, uh, so the family, even beyond the brothers, were involved with with the production of this film in a, kind of an advisory role. They were hanging out on, on set uh, a lot, and um, there was a bit of a conflict, <laughs> a bit of an argument between the family, the writers, and uh, also the 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 uh, main actor Brad Dourif about sort of the nature of this story because John Huston was uh, was sort of a, described by uh, them as a, a devout atheist. And uh, he thought this whole thing was basically just a comedy. And there was kind of a debate between the people who, who were closer to Flannery and Huston about whether this was a religious story or not, with Huston insisting on a totally psychological interpretation. And... Uh, it's interesting because, I mean, I've heard a number of different versions of this story, but basically this debate was happening and uh, Brad Dourif was taking sides with the Fitzgeralds on this point. And uh, I've heard different versions of the quote, but basically the next day, Houston, John Houston is at the table. They're, they're eating together and he says, OK, Jesus wins. But basically, Houston realized that he had been sort of tricked into <laughs> telling Flannery's story rather than what he thought, you know. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know what? What he thought his interpretation should be. So, well, you know what's funny anyway, about that yeah, is, is that it's it's almost like a microcosm of the the dynamic that plays out in Hazel Moat's life. You know, in this story, there's like a kind of railing against mm. that almost is an even greater confirmation of the existence of something than 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 not. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Right when you go around saying the only thing that matters is that Jesus. So what does he say that Jesus Christ didn't exist, doesn't exist, or uh, something like yeah. that? Yeah, uh, it's a little bit protesting too much, right? Yeah, you know, it's also worth saying uh, by way of introduction that there's this big film about Flannery O'Connor and her work coming down the pipelines. Uh, what's mm. it called Wildcat? That's Wildcat, um, yeah. Ethan Hawke and his daughter. Um, so, uh, you know, did Ethan Hawke direct it or produce it? He directed it. I just okay. finished listening to the yeah. interview that they did with Bishop Barron. If you guys haven't listened to that yet, you really should. It was I was it expecting it to be just kind of okay. It was tremendous. Like it's it's fascinating. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, Ethan Hawke is a very very smart guy, um, yeah. and Maya Hawke had an interesting perspective too about about uh, you know she had done uh, selections from Flannery O'Connor's prayer journal as like. And I think like an MFA or, or some kind of some like an agency audition, something like that. I forget. Um, uh, so a very un unconventional choice. She just sort of discovered this this book in like a bookstore somewhere. Um, so there's kind of an interesting connection. Yeah. Um, well, Katie, you're most familiar with the story. So do you want to sort of like give give people of a, a, a sense of what the film is about? Uh, sure. So uh, Hazel Motes is our um, main protagonist. We've got him, uh, the, 
very beginning of the story, returning from the war. Um, so an interesting thing about the film is that um, you know the the story, the novel is set in the you know in the present day when it's published, and the first edition is in 1949. Uh, so Hazel um, in the novel is coming back from World War II, uh, but in the film it's pretty obvious that he has to be coming back from Vietnam or something like this. So um, if the you know the the historical aspect of it doesn't um, land too hard because as we talked about um, in the lead up to this there, there's kind of a timeless feel uh, to, to the way that it's done so you could um, you know you could just kind of ignore what the clothes look like and credit that this is you know um, an original version um, rather than an updating but uh, so Hazel's coming back um, it's pretty clear that he's been in some way traumatized during his war experience and that his um, childhood religiosity has been sort of burned off by this experience of war and violence and you know human hatred and human evil right um, and he's become sort of an existentialist so he has this run-in with uh, you know a woman on the train as he's coming in you know and she's uh, she, she's this very stereotypical you know she she tracks kind of to the grandmother in um, a good man is hard to find right she's this classically southern very you know proper very prim very you know, polite lady and she's making all of these platitudinous observations about how sweet life is and how good everything is and you know Hazel just squint eyes her and is like I reckon you think you've been redeemed right? <laughs> <laughs> you know so so it's clear from the beginning he's having none of the religious view of life or uh, certainly none of the um you know the the platitudinous or um you know, like conventional religious way of life. Um, so he right. comes into town. He's um, looking for ways to do things he ain't never done before. Right? He's trying to shake off all the last of any sentimentality, any like you know, emotion, any kind of attachment to right the conventionally beautiful, true and good. So immediately he finds a woman to commit adultery with. He goes and he finds himself a villain hat, like a black hat, like the misfit which immediately everyone identifies as a preacher's hat <laughs> like oh you're a preacher no um, so um you know he he kind of becomes what everybody seems to think that he should be and he decides to become a preacher but instead what he's preaching is the church of so this is different um in the novel it's the church of it's the church of christ without christ or the church of truth without christ um in the the film is the church of truth without christ um and uh, you know it becomes obvious that he's doing this as a way to kind of process you know religious trauma from his childhood where you know he has um, seen uh, you know he's he's been told the story of faith in a very productive kind of way um, and he's also like I don't know I'm probably getting way too far ahead of where we want to be so where <laughs> where, where no, do we want to like is, anyone jump in good. and stop me because I'll just tell <laughs> I think you the this whole is novel. probably a good spot to to <laughs> yeah. pause because. Yeah. that is really where most of the film lives is yeah. him kind of as a street preacher uh you know doing his thing not having a ton of success um but uh he's trying to start the church of truth without christ right 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 yeah uh, so yeah so i think now we can just talk about that um yeah you know yeah. We'll, we'll get to how it ends uh but right. before we do i just want to say that when i was in high school me and my friends had a term for this kind of platitudinous religion and we used to call it uh, the cliché or getting oh. clichéd. Um, it's, it's like when when you have like I some never sort heard of, that. Yeah, you have some sort of issue, some sort of problem, and then some you know uh, religious person just gives you some platitude to like just like ru like run roughshod right over it. It's like getting macheted with a cliche. Um, so uh, we were always always very deliberately Somehow trying I, yeah. to avoid the cliché. <laughs> that's funny so that's brilliant um, so, so yeah that's what that's absolutely what hazel is pushing back against and he has his sort of um you, you know his comeback for every one of these right the the thought of being redeemed by the blood of jesus is this big thing for him and he's like no it's my blood my blood is what's redeeming me i'm listening to my blood and i'm hearing the message it's giving me you know? yeah well yeah we should also probably mention this uh, this other character 
Um, yeah. This kind of like odd young man that he encounters um, uh, his first couple days in the city. I forget what his name is. Is it Emery or something? It's Enoch Emery. Enoch Emery. Yeah. Enoch Emery. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because he's the one who actually talks about blood too. Um, mm-hmm. So do you want to say a word about Enoch? <laughs> So Enoch fancies himself kind of a, I don't know if he fancies himself a prophet, but certainly O'Connor fancies him a kind of backwards or strange prophet, right? Um, There's this whole thing about how he has wise blood, right? His wise blood tells him what to do, and he has to listen to it, even if it's dangerous, even if it's insane, even if it makes no sense, whatever. Um, And this this is a place where the narration of the novel gets us a lot deeper into what that's like for him. Um, than I think the the film medium can do, but uh, mm. you know we definitely pick up that he's doing he's doing strange or outre things because he thinks he has to, and there's some sort of pseudo religious quality to that that feeling of duty or obligation. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Right. So. Yeah. Um. There's there's a lot of interesting, I mean, just to talk about maybe some of the listeners haven't read anything by Flannery O'Connor and um, you know, this, this film doesn't have the narration, but it does have the dialogue and Flannery O'Connor's dialogue to me is one of the most enjoyable things about her stories, especially the kind of like the wry, the wry satire, these just the, the way that people talk. I mean, you mentioned the cliches. I mean, so, so um, you know, he says to the woman on the train, I reckon you think you've been redeemed and she says, life is an inspiration, which is like, <laughs> you know, okay, so he's, he's you know, for, for, there's there's a bit that is Flannery O'Connor taking, not taking Hazel Motz's side, but taking the side of satirizing this woman's religiosity because it's such a, like, it's just like such a weird response, <laughs> you know? Um uh, but, but, you know, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of things like that, where the, the way the characters talk is there's, there's kind of this, like, there's this, pre- this, this precision of stupidity <laughs> that like Flannery O'Connor uses in constructing the dialogue. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's hard to describe, but it's like, it's like self-satirizing dialogue somehow without even any, I mean, not that the the narration is not satirizing as well in her, in her, her work, but but uh, just 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 hearing the dialogue spoken out loud, it's like immediately like it like passes judgment on itself in a way. It's, it's I don't this know. wonderfully yeah. folded use of irony, right? Because the character means one thing and O'Connor wants you to hear something else and you hear them both at the same time. And it, it, yeah, right. <laughs> it's so clever. And you can hear yeah. and you can also hear it with like a certain sincerity from from the character at the same time. No, that's right. right. And like yeah. you can take it. There are like levels of truth and levels of, you know, false falsity that are brilliantly kind of put together yeah she's not always just laughing at the character she's sometimes wanting you to hear it in earnest too so sometimes there's two folds instead of just one yeah and her dialogue is um it can't it can be terse and uh i think it work. i think it comes across i don't know how literally the dialogue is taken from the book but to me it felt like flannery dialogue and it and it felt like it worked well spoken out loud you know yeah a lot of the lines are lifted straight so um it's actually a very faithful adaptation in that regard yeah yeah i think that for me uh the dialogue was sometimes a little hit or miss um i think that in probably more instances than not it landed well but there was definitely a part of me watching this that had this distinct sense that oh man that monologue probably worked a lot better in the book or, or something like that. Now that, that might just be me, but there, it just felt like there were a handful of instances. Um, say for instance, when he first meets uh, Enoch and they're walking together and we get like a really long time with Enoch kind of going on and on about himself and, and his life. And um, it, it, there are segments of that that feel like, yeah, if this if this wasn't a literary adaptation, this whole sequence probably would have been half as long. Um, and yet somehow I think it's from a um, uh, probably a, a certain reverence to the source text um, that a lot of that is preserved. And I, I got that impression watching it. I thought, I bet you, one, this is very faithful dialogue. And two, I bet you some of it could have been trimmed. 
but that's my personal opinion. <laughs> For sure. Actually, some yeah. of it was trimmed, yeah. So yeah, you're still getting that feeling after they've cut out about half of it. So maybe a quarter yeah. could have. Uh, the, the one scene where I, I saw what you're talking about is um, where Enoch's kind of monologuing about the, the, you know, the woman's house where he got Jesus crazy, right? <laughs> yeah. um, mm-hmm. You know, uh-huh. sanctified crazy is, is the line, right? Um, you know, and they're, they're walking along and Hazel is just like, will you stop talking? There's this expression yeah. on Duriff's face, um, you know, and uh, it, the, they have to be walking because there's otherwise no movement to the scene except what's in the language, right? Um, but it is Enoch telling this story of how he escaped this woman's house by basically doing a... Um, like a reverse Joseph with Potiphar's wife. Like he's standing there without his clothes on so that they'll like kick him out of the house so that he won't have right. to be there anymore. <laughs> right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And so you yeah. can see how that just works way better yeah. when it's on the page. Yeah, and that if it yeah. weren't a literary adaptation, maybe we would have gotten like a flashback or something showing this, this occurrence. Um, but, uh, but the, as it is rendered here, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a nitpick criticism because also mm-hmm. the thing that I liked most about the film is how these characters are represented and they're mainly represented in the dialogue and in these like interactions that they're having having mm-hmm. so um so yeah mm-hmm. it's it's a nitpick and it's mainly yeah. me just trying to like contribute even though i haven't read the book <laughs> yeah but what i think so, it does sorry just one yeah what i think it does is that it gives us what you would you know what's in hazel's mind in the narration you get visually through duraf's performance right you get this feeling of oh when will this kid leave me alone right um, you know it, you get the kind of dynamic between them um through that that interaction uh, that you you know you wouldn't get any other way so yeah so hazel he his father was a preacher and uh you know we get these flashback sequences where he's sort of having the fear of hell put into him these these this a scene, there's like a scene of childhood transgression, you know, where he looks at like a, a peep show uh, thing as a kid in a carnival setting. Um, and uh, I mean, I'm sure Flannery wouldn't have handled that, you know, as explicitly as they did if they were if she was making the movie. But um, but uh, we see him doing penance as a child. He's putting rocks in his shoes, walking around. Um, one of the really important images from the book, which doesn't come out at least as strongly in the film, is his his image of Jesus as this kind of like this shadowy like sort of figure flitting between the tr- trees sort of like uh chasing him is that is that something that i mean is that something that I, I seem to recall that being like a really a recurring image in the book that didn't really make it so much into the movie. Is that right? You're right. It is. And it doesn't come into the movie. No, you're right. Um, and maybe that has something to do with uh, with Houston's re- resistance to that interpretation at first. I can see that not having been part of the plan. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, it's certainly part of O'Connor's intention. Right. Right. So go ahead. So he's kind of like running away from uh, from Jesus in the film, but also sort of there's like an ambiguity because he won't stop talking about Jesus. So there's also kind of like a clinging to Jesus, as, right. as James pointed out. Yeah. Um, and he ends up meeting up with this this sort of fraudulent preacher, Asa Hawks and his daughter, uh, Sabbath Lily Hawks. Um, and there's a whole there's a whole sort of interaction uh, with them. And then there's another fraudulent preacher who tries to like co-opt his Church of Truth without Christ and turn it into the Church of Jesus Christ without Christ, and just like all of this absurd stuff. Um, but you know, uh, with that, the, the, he keeps sort of rubbing up against. Even if he weren't trying to be a preacher himself, like he keeps sort of rubbing up against the, uh, you know, against this this Jesus thing. And, and, you know, what's interesting is it's, it seems to me that, um, when he, when he decides to go to the city, you know, he, he says, I'm going to do some things I've never done before. He doesn't talk about preaching. Am I right that it's only after he runs into the preacher, Asa, the blind, supposedly blind preacher, Asa Hawks, that he decides to be a preacher himself, almost like in reaction against that, right? That's right. Exactly right. Yeah. He does not go with the original intention of preaching, but it's like the way that everyone reacts to him is like, this is what we're looking for from you. And he gives over to that basically, but he says, okay, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to tell the truth, but I'm going to tell it my way um, without Jesus. And this is, you know, this is going to be the result. Um, But but then the result is you can't see him without thinking of Jesus, right? <laughs> yeah, because yeah, right. even the taxi driver says that there's something about 
his look. It's not just the hat, but it's like mm. his his face or his eyes. His face, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then that's kind of uh there's there's a there's a parallel at the end when the sheriff pulls him over and says, I don't like your face. <laughs> so I don't know what, what that's about, but Yeah. Yeah, and you know, um it's interesting something similar in a way happens with the um Enoch Emery character. Uh now Enoch is this guy who walked with the Lord, right, in the Old Testament and then was eventually sort of assumed into heaven or disappeared, you know, uh we we assume sort of transitioned into the afterlife and a you know, without a normal death on the earth or something like that. Um, there's sort of apocryphal literature about Enoch that sort of ex- explicates some of, the, some of this, I believe. Um, but uh, he uh, he works at the zoo and he has this fascination with monkeys. Um, and there's an interesting like push and pull with him because so there's this there's this uh, there's a scene later on or a, a sequence later on where he is trying to bring this new Jesus, quote unquote, to uh, to Hazel. And it's this museum exhibit of this like ancient, shrunken, mummified man uh, who I think I, it really is Flannery O'Connor's commentary on like this modern religion of like evolution or like tracing our, our primitive human roots, right? And that being like the new idol, you know, or the new the new source of wisdom, um, but at the same time, and 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 he's also trying to go shake the hand of this guy in a gorilla suit, <laughs> and then he puts on the gorilla suit himself. All this kind of like absurd shenanigans. Um, but earlier in the movie, he works at the zoo, and he's he he likes to go to the monkey exhibit and like just harangue the monkeys, and and so th- he's saying, you know, you think you're almost as good as us, and you know, the, he, so he's also resisting this idea of like the equation of human beings and monkeys, this sort of like evolutionary equation and i have to say there's like something extremely based about putting monkeys in their place in my (laughs) opinion like i can totally relate to that like to that sentiment there's Um, something like super anti-darwinist going on here yeah right like she's trying to make clear that like there's no commensurability between like the human and the the animal kingdoms in the way that people want to say that there is yeah go ahead sorry right yeah you know, my parents have an Alexa thing, and uh, when I first discovered that they had Alexa, I would just like verbally abuse Alexa no. regularly, just just to like, just like in the same way as Enoch does the monkeys. I was just sort of like making a point, like this is not a person, like I I have no. I have no like obligations to be polite to this thing. Like I, I don't know. It was just like I, I took great satisfaction and just <laughs> like some, haranguing. There's something Alexa. like unsettling um, about something that is. It, it's the AI problem, right? It's the you know this is acting like a human, but it's not. It's the uncanny valley, right? Yeah. When right. Yeah. Uh, we we used to have a Google Home, and uh, we always made a point of being very polite with our Google because <laughs> we didn't want. Uh, our son, Brendan, to, you know, learn to ask for things without saying please. So we were always saying <laughs> please to the Google. But then one day, you know, our, our our son, you know, who was just growing up and learning to talk, he he like addressed Google. And I thought, wait a second, I don't even want him doing this at all. So we got rid of it. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I can see how that might be confusing. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. Yeah. Um... But yeah, so Enoch's very, um, it's actually much stronger in the film than in the, in the book. This is an aspect where they put all, uh, they put some stuff in like Enoch's, you know, being extremely rude. And it's interesting because O'Connor is not transliterating whatever it is that Enoch says to the monkeys. Like she, she doesn't come out and say, he said this and he said that, um, you know, Mm -hmm. that that's imported or that's put in in some way right in fact the line where you know enoch says you know I, if i had a face like that i'd sit on it right and never get up um which is super rude um which i you know, but he actually says in the book he's like looking at the the monkey's bottom it's obviously like a baboon or something that has like you know no fur um on its seat where you know uh, other species would um 
you know, and the, the baboon's kind of showing itself off to the, the people, and um, it, the the narration says, tells us that Enoch's being prudish, right? He says, if I had ass like that, forget my French, I would sit on it and never, you know, I would sit on it, I wouldn't show it to all these people, right? So there's mm. like a difference in emphasis here. Mm. Um, and I've, I've wondered why the difference in emphasis, but I don't know that I have a good answer for that. Does, does yeah. O'Connor imply this idea that he is... He is rejecting the idea of equality, but that he's like sensing this this idea that people think monkeys are almost equal to humans and sort of rejecting it. Is that is that implied at all in the O'Connor narration there? It's it, it's very I mean, if it's anywhere, it's sort of in the in the literal level. Right. And you have to pull it out yourself. She's not forcing right. any kind of interpretation on. He's that. not saying right. anything like that. Yeah. It, she she's putting down. Yeah. He's not he's not talking about like this connection at all. Yeah. You know, he's I don't think okay. he's as a character bright enough to or educated enough necessarily to even be aware of that, right? In fact, there's right. a lot of emphasis placed on how, like, dim Enoch is. <laughs> yep. Right. So. Right, and it, and it might be a dim person who would be particularly sens- <laughs> sensitive to, like, the monkeys are still not my equal. Like, I'm not smart, but, you know, <laughs> I'm, smart enough I'm to still know. smarter than <laughs> yeah. these monkeys. I'm smart know? enough to know that the, there's uh, a difference between, right, uh, you know. Right, yeah. right. So... Yeah, the no, cool thing. I, yeah, sorry. Go I was ahead. just yeah. gonna say that um, the cool thing about this character Enoch is that, as outlandish as he is, it somehow, some somehow he fits in within the ensemble of characters that we get in this in this film. Um, hmm. Everybody is so strange. So Hazel Moats, very strange. This uh, you know this this prostitute that he checks up with early on, very strange. Um, the, yeah. uh, other love interest that arises down the road, Sabbath Lily, very strange. Her father, Asa Hawks, super strange. Um, so it's, it's this collection of misfits. And mm-hmm. I think that that's one of the things that's so delightful about the film is not just these characters, but then also the performances that we get for each of them. I think any one of them sort of taken out of context, separated from the ensemble would almost feel like too much. Um, you know, I think you could pick any one of them and, 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 and basically say that, uh, whether it's Hazel Motes and just how angry he gets in so many of the scenes or, or Sabbath in her sort of weird attempts at seduction. Um, but, but, but somehow when they're all together, it becomes like a, an attitude of this world and it's super pleasurable. And in fact, I I feel like this film it's hard to say what what was uh, the inspiration for other films that followed, whether it was this film or if it was just Flannery O'Connor herself. But I feel like you can look at a lot of contemporary cinema and see echoes of this. Um, one name that comes to mind in particular is Martin McDonough. I, uh, Martin McDonough is an Irish, uh, initially a playwright, then uh, you know writer and director for the screen. Um, people would know his billboards outside of uh, Ebbing, Missouri, um, or... Uh, let's see, in Bruges. Um, but I first thought of him because he has an awesome play. I think it was the last play he did um, called A Behanding in Spokane. And there's a character in that named Marvin, I think. And he's kind of like this dim-witted uh, hotel clerk uh, who on weekends like takes speed and goes to the zoo and like berates the monkeys. And so I think mm. that... I think that, uh, that 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 you know that's a pretty like obvious connection but you look at margaret martin mcdonough's work and i hope that we eventually maybe will cover one of his films on the podcast although they're pretty racy um uh uh they they all feature characters like this seven psychopaths i don't know if you've seen that but that's just like seven whacked out people um so so yeah so i think that that's uh that's when I think about the things that I most enjoyed in this film, that's probably the one that stands out most prominently. And Enoch is a great example of it. Yeah. I don't know if it's this film so much, although it is again, a well-regarded film by this well-known filmmaker. Um, But there are a number of filmmakers that I can see the Flannery stamp on a little bit. And I would, I would say the Coen brothers. I mean, there's even like a bit of a Flannery O'Connor reference in raising Arizona, one of their early films. Um, uh, definitely McDonough, 
um and also uh who um you know even terrence malick's first film badlands oh yeah has some flannery o'connor vibes to me totally um totally. and it's about this kind it's about a kind of like a misfit you know type character yes so, well that was another um, film that came to mind uh as i was watching it was was badlands uh also natural born killers yeah. um but uh yeah but, but it's not just the plot it's the dialogue and there's even some voice some voiceover in badlands that is very o'connor like humor i mean there's yes. a line in there where, she, where the, the protagonist the main character she says like you know my dad thought that you know if piano lessons didn't keep me off the street maybe the clarinet would or something <laughs> like that and that to me is a very flannery o'connor yeah. line yeah. in um, uh fargo yeah. as well fargo's the coen brothers too right Yes. Uh, right. So there's yeah. that, that scene in the car um, where one of the killers is just like it rattling on and on and on. And the other one is like, I, you, you can't you can't keep doing this. Like, I'm going to lose my mind. Right? That, that um, when I saw Hazel right. and, you know, Enoch walking down the street, I thought of that scene. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, people say the Coen brothers have a coldness towards their characters or maybe a, some some people allege that they have like a contempt for people or something mm-hmm. or their characters. And, you know, uh, I don't know if they are are uh, more cold towards their characters than Flannery, but they very much have that self-satirizing dialogue in a lot of their films, you know? Another big way that this film resembles works from Malick or the Coen brothers is that it, it, it's distinctly American, you know, in its, in its mm. setting and in its world, it just feels so American Badlands I've, I, or or um, Days of Heaven feel similar in that respect. Um, Fargo certainly. Um, so you know it, the world doesn't just come through in the the choice of dialect, right? The way these characters are speaking, although that is a big part of it. But yeah. it's also just kind of like the whole milieu, all these sort of ancillary characters, other right. experiences, the the street preacher thing or the the images of dairy queen or something you know it just has this um this yeah this american quality which i don't know i i'm always curious when i'm watching a film like this how a non-american audience reacts to this and i wonder mm. if that doesn't have something to do with how well regarded this film is as kind of a uh, a novel look at a part of America that maybe doesn't often get as much play on, on cin- in cinema, you know? Right. Uh, just to go to, to clarify what I said earlier about Badlands. So Badlands came out in 1973. This film was 79. So the influence would be definitely, if anything, from, from O'Connor herself rather than uh, this film in that particular case. Um, so yeah, yeah. I think people do really like the opening credits sequence of this film, which is showing all of the different sort of like roadside signs and sort of, you know, Southern, uh, Southern religion, you know, sort of artifacts, um, that I think that there was even, a, uh, I, if I remember correctly, I think I heard that there was a, sort of like a book, uh, that somebody made with all these photos of these kinds of things. And they sort of tracked down some of the, these signs and, and use them in the film. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, um, the, there's, well, Katie, you mentioned, uh, before we recorded this, that you were not a fan of the music. <laughs> Uh, yeah. in the film and since we're talking about the opening sequence yeah. maybe we can talk about the music a little bit and the and the Americanness of it all right so, so yeah so, so like um, contrast the feeling ahead. of the the cinematography like the photography itself which is very faithful to I mean I grew up in that region like between 10 and 20 years later than the filming of this movie so I you know it, it looks right and they went to um it, they filmed it in macon georgia which is the right place mm. to do it like this you know talkingham would be kind of like macon you know this small small ish but with aspirations to be bigger kind of place in in northern georgia um so that's right uh like it felt right visually um the music gave it i i have i'm so conflicted about the music okay guys so um, <laughs> <laughs> On the one hand, um, it, it gives you this comic feel, like it gives you the accurate sense that like this is supposed to be in many ways and is in many ways a funny story, right? Um, but in doing that, I think that it also participates in this sort of like cultural feeling or 
you know, gla- or like angle toward um, people in the South, right? Okay, do you guys know of a show? You probably oh, won't yeah, know I was this. Just this about is, to, okay. I was just about to this. <laughs> okay, there's a show called... The Beverly he- Hillbillies? Well, the Beverly Hillbillies, oh, and then there's okay. like a music show called Hee Haw, and I, it was apparently a huge thing. I just remember seeing like reruns of it when I was very, very small, like early 80s, early to mid 80s. Um, you know, it, it's, it, but it was like an entire, yeah, it, there was this entire, Green Acres is another one, like there's this entire sort of cultural, um, you know, sub draft toward like making fun of people who live in these regions, right? And that the music felt like that it was sort of making fun of the region. Um, and mm-hmm. it could be that I'm oversensitive about this because of No, I don't there, think but, so. Yeah. I really did not care for the music myself. Yeah. Um, if it had just been yeah. the opening sequence, I would have been yeah. down, you know, because yeah. I, like, I like the opening a lot. The montage of images paired with this music um, is very nice. Uh, uh, and and good in setting setting the stage for this world, but then it was so so often it, it felt like it served to actually uh, undermine dramatically what what was going on. I get yeah, I get I that agree. maybe you want to find ways of lightening things a little bit because otherwise maybe maybe the film can veer too far into a kind of like seriousness that isn't necessarily um, you know. Uh, uh, accurate, but it's it is it is serious and it is dark, you know. Mm-hmm. And and I felt like the music was constantly like keeping it from from even going there. It was always yeah. like suffocating mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Now to, in the last right. in the last like quarter or third of the film, I did notice a distinct shift um, into more silence, yes. mm-hmm. and I appreciated that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. But but still, every once in a while, it would come back. And it would just almost feel like a gag, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that it was a That's little... That's kind of like cartoony sounding Yeah, music, I think yeah. there was a little bit of a yeah. missed mark. I think, Thomas, you said, like, when we were watching it, like, these arrangements are really busy. They draw a lot of attention to themselves. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so the the, um, the score is by Alex North, and um, it uses a number of pre-existing melodies so that the, the opening... The, sort of the main theme is really this this tune, Tennessee Waltz, which is really the only thing I remembered about the soundtrack. I didn't remember how like over-the-top the whole soundtrack for the film is um, because I had seen it several years ago, and uh, I also remembered Tennessee Waltz because I had to play it on like a cruise ship <laughs> <laughs> gig with the, with the jazz group. Uh, but so I had I had actually I think learned it before I saw the movie. But um, but uh, yeah, it uses a number of other things. It also uses uh, the hymn "Simple Gifts." It uses towards the end. Actually, my favorite cue is the use that it makes of. Um, I know it as the glory of these 40 days. I'm sure that's not the original like melody uh, title. It might be a Bach chorale, something like that, but it's kind of like a, a sober sounding thing. And they use that towards the end of the film and it felt right to me uh, compared to some of the other parts. But yeah, I mean, when you, the Tennessee Waltz, the way they use it has this kind of like nostalgic quality, which sometimes feels at odds with, with the scenes, with the, the tone of the film. But yeah, the, the arrangement also, it really draws a lot of attention to itself in, in that like, okay, so in the scene where um, where uh, Hazel is exploring his, I, I think it's implied to be his family's old home that's now sort of abandoned and run down um, before he goes to the city. Uh, they, they're doing like the Tennessee Waltz theme, but then they put this kind of like, they take the figuration from like a specific Bach prelude that I recognize and like put it underneath Tennessee Waltz and then like they're they're compli- combining Tennessee Waltz and like simple gifts and they're doing all these like fancy arrangements and stuff and then some of the some of the scenes sound like you know Bugs Money music or something you know so like it's it just it's just really aside from whether it fits tonally it's so busy and like constantly uh changing it up and there's so so many uh the music is so complex that it that it actually ends up drawing too much attention to itself, even quite aside from its emotional yeah. suitability. The scenes where I felt like it worked best were actually the Enoch Emery scenes, because that is the mood that we're in mm. when we're with Enoch. I, you guys know that O'Connor was a cartoonist before she was a novelist, right? Um, she was she worked for mm. her college paper and she drew the cartoons, right? That was her thing. So, um, you know, and she actually went to Iowa for journalism before she switched over to fiction. You know, she okay. took a hit, like she took, you know, 
know, two courses, like she took two days of class <laughs> at Iowa <laughs> in journalism. And she went to the creating Pride program with a letter that said, my name is Flannery O'Connor. I am not a journalist. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Can you please switch me over? Right. So, um, it, so all that to say though, that like, you know, she has this playfulness, right? She has this ability to sort of come at a scene with this framing that's, you know, essentially comic and the sketching that's essentially like Enoch is a cartoon, right? Enoch is one of her cartoons right. in a sense, right? But um, it, do you think it's kind yeah. of gilding the lily to like put that mute? I mean, he's already so goofy that. But exactly, he's that already really so goofy. It, it's like it, it's not trusting the viewer to get it. <laughs> you know, it, to to kind of hit mm-hmm. that note so hard, I think. Um, right. it, but still, there's not the tone mismatch that there is later when right. you know, it, it, like it, it's that last scene, it, particularly the at the end as you guys mentioned there is kind of a tonal shift in music toward the end there is more silence but you know, then that last scene where we're zooming out um, and I don't want to spoil or get too far ahead but um, we're zooming out and we kind of shouldn't be the, the novel's zooming in like closer to Hazel closer to his face and his vision which is going to be really important thematically right um, and instead what we're getting is sort of a repeat of that am I right do I remember right that like that sort of Tennessee Waltz, um, that music that's there when he's viewing his old home is there again at the end, um, or something that think, very closely I think parallels. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There, there's like yeah. a parallelism there, and it felt it, it just hit me wrong. Like I thought this hmm. this is not the note that we want to that we want to end on here. Right. Yeah. Maybe to talk generally about the sort of the the religious experiment that Flannery O'Connor was making with this with this story, right? My understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that, she, you know, Flannery O'Connor is this Catholic growing up in the South, the Southern version of Christianity around her, and she decides to take this kind of Pentecostal thing and say, what would an actual saint look like yeah. in this Pentecostal type of religion? Yeah, in her letters, she um, describes uh, Hazel as a kind of Protestant saint. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right. And so he ends up he ends up going in a sort of a penitential direction and um, and he's taking on certain certain practices like, you know, akin to akin to, you know, the medieval hair shirt or, you know, various. And then I'm sure it's been done. I'm sure people still use the hair shirt, so I don't want to just consign it to the Middle Ages. But they ain't quit um, doing it as long as I'm doing it. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's like carrying the torch without even knowing it. But it's interesting, too, because, you know, when he's talking to his landlady at the end and she's protesting at these bizarre practices, she says, it's like, you know, what does she say? It's like, you know, uh, walling, pe- cat, walling up cats and or being a saint or being a monk. You know, she's like combining Edgar Allan Poe with the Catholic <laughs> Church, which is like perfect which for like what a lot of Protestants <laughs> think of, you know, European Catholicism. Right. Um, so. So, um, yeah. And and. And and she says, you know, it's like sometimes I think you're like an agent of the Pope or something. And that actually surprised me that that uh, I don't know if this is in the novel, but uh, it's it's so explicitly drawing the connection to Catholicism there I, in a way that I didn't expect. I, I sort of expected it to just remain more more implicit that he's moving in this Catholic direction without knowing it. But uh, yeah, I found that I find that quite interesting that he's sort of like his need for penance ends up drawing him in this in this direction towards these extreme, you know, practices that are associated with, you know, uh, Catholicism. Yeah, every aspect of his penance is sort of, you know, exactly like the sort of extremist things that, um, you know, and, and you know, Asa's, Asa Hawks's whole thing with blinding himself too, like all of these extreme penances are, you know, things that you can absolutely kind of credit, um, you know, extremes or, I mean, they would be, I think, you know, in the church's penitential tradition, acknowledged as, um, you know, it, going too far right obviously there's um you right. know the line in, in the novel about hawks at least right? blinding right. yourself would. like you might be able yeah. to get away with rocks and yeah issues, it, o'connor can't yeah. like resist um getting into the narration there you know where she talks about hawks blinding himself which we later find out um spoiler alert he didn't actually do um you know, she says, you know, he had been possessed of as many devils as were necessary to do it. So, like, there's an acknowledgement that, like, that would be a wrong thing to do. But, you know, this sort mm-hmm. of impulse toward um, expiation, like this impulse toward, um, you know, 
like participating in the passion of Christ and giving satisfaction for sin that's sort of extracted from the um, the version of religion that we got that we got from the woman on the train at the beginning. Um, you know, it, Hazel's that's mm-hmm. what he's drawn to. He's attracted to that sense that like he could he could participate in some way in this, you know, in the suffering of Christ. Hmm. Right. Um, it, it, but he doesn't want to be attracted to that. Right. Which is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Something that was not clear to me in the film, um, was the, the moment of change for him. I mean, well, I guess first I should ask, does he have, is he having a come to Jesus moment? Is there a conversion? And then two, what is it really specifically that occasions that shift? It can't just be that his car ends up in the lake, or can it? Maybe because... Well, uh, I was watching yeah. some as extra features on the Criterion Channel, and I don't remember if it was one of the writers or Brad Dourif who said that to them that was the exact moment that he had his change. Um, not necessarily in like a causal way, but I mean, it's fun. It's funny to, when you think about the car, right? The car is this big symbol too. And it's also part of the Americanness right. of the story. Right. Yeah. You know, when he says there's nothing more, there's nothing more American than saying anyone with a good car doesn't need to be justified. Right. Uh, you know, that's, that could be like an ACDC song. Or something. <laughs> um, uh, ACDC's so, not American so, though, are they? <laughs> yeah, but they are, they are, they're Australian, but. Australians are sort of a strange kind of American. No, no, it, it'd be better um, as a Metallica song. That would be cool. <laughs> sure, sure. So, so, um, uh, so, yeah, he, he keeps insisting that this is a good car. It's like the car is anyone in the good car doesn't need uh, to be justified. And so he's insisting against all evidence and all testimony from mechanics that, yeah, this is a good car. And, uh, and so then when the car, you know, essentially g- gets baptized and, it, and it, it's parallel with his insistence that that he that he doesn't need to be just justified. Right. So so and then he's good. He's already clean. And so then when the car gets baptized, there's a kind of like a symbolic image. I don't know if it's the cause. But, yeah, but maybe I guess that's it's just what sort of a, it's something it's it's not the cause in like an, an ultimate sense, but it maybe it's something that like clicks the switch for him. Yeah. You know? And that's what I'm, I'm indicating is that I can see that this is sort of chronologically the moment where there's a shift, but, but it still was kind of lost on me, like how to track that decision and what really was it that, that brought, that, that brought about this change of heart. Warning, warning, extreme spoilers from this point on. Well, I would say, uh, you know, it's gotta be the guilt, you know, because he commits a murder, you know, the guilt has to be sort of festering in there as well, you know, and, and, uh, uh, I just, I'm currently rereading Crime and Punishment, um, which I also had, you know, read probably, probably like the year before or two years before I read Wise Blood, uh, for the first time in, in high school. And, uh, uh, I have to think there's gotta be some influence from Crime and Punishment on this book too. I mean, I could be wrong, but I mean, just the idea that this guy is, he's, he's killing almost just as a statement, right? As a statement that I can tr- surpass, I can go over, I can transgress this limit and I can survive it, you know? And it turns out in Crime and Punishment, he really can't survive it, right? So uh, so in this case too, I think there's a similar dynamic going on that like in Crime and Punishment, do you really know exactly what the, the moment when he finally repents is, you know, there's not any one thing that, is the direct cause of it. I don't think it's more, it's the mystery of grace, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We don't know exactly the, like, I don't think you can pinpoint in either in the text or in the film, like an exact moment, but yeah, I do see the resonance between Motes and Raskolnikov, right? This, um, you know, if nothing matters, then I can do this. Wait, if I do this, then, you know, I find out that everything matters. Right. Um, you know, yeah. Even when he's, you know, showing back uh, up at the at the the room that he's renting with the bag of uh, lime or whatever, and and is gonna put his his eyes out when he does so. Even then, it's not super clear to me that it's proceeding from a place of repentance. Uh, what the film gives us is just enough information to see it cutting both ways. Um, in fact, my first take was. Okay, he he's having options denied him. He's running from our Lord and and even 
his car is, has been taken away. And, and this is the final act of defiance, the final act of rebellion, the final uh, turning away in a very decisive way. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to put my eyes out to this reality of grace. And then it's like, it made me think of the Psalm where, you know, um, even in the dark, I, 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 there's nowhere that I, I, I'm paraphrasing terribly, but, but it's, it's like, even in the deepest pit, there yeah. you are. And, yeah. and so now that he's retreated to this final horizon, which really is just inside of himself, this, 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 this place of encounter, which is the heart and the, the interior, there's nowhere mm. now left to run. And it's almost right. like now he has to face our Lord. Yeah. Because the other things he says are, are after that are explicitly penitential, right? Yes. But but yeah. we don't actually. Uh, yeah, you're right. They, it's not totally clear. I mean, I do take it basically as penitential and as like going where Asa Hawks wouldn't go. Um, yeah. But, but but I wonder if it isn't yeah. sort of like to demonstrate to Asa, you know, his 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 faith in no Christ. That that I I will I will even go so far as to blind myself for this hmm. this this nihilism. What you couldn't even do for for our Lord, you know. Interesting question. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I have to say the part that I moves me most at the end is when she's uh, the landlady tells him he should uh, start preaching again, and he says, "I ain't got time." Mm-hmm. Oh, cool. I just find that very moving. Yeah. 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 Well, That's like the thing that really puts it together to me and, and makes it more, more than just like the grotesque, all the grotesquerie of the ending. Like that's the part that like really lands for me emotionally in the film, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tremendous line. And yeah, just to kind of pursue the line of thought that you opened up James um, about like the chain of causality. Like, can we say that, you know, the, the moment in the car it, it, that when he loses the car is the moment that he comes to repentance and the act of blinding himself is a re- you know an act of repentance and then he's doing penance after that or is the blinding himself the thing that he's doing repentance for like is it that he has to physically do that before he can see that he's spiritually done it to himself all mm. along yeah right and then that mm. is you know and, and then he's repenting for that for the blinding you know both you know symbolic and then literal um yeah yeah i don't, I don't know but well, does o'connor the, shed any light on this uh, in the narration i think it's ambiguous i think you could read the novel and ask the same question you know it, yeah well the yeah. one okay. the one clue in the that the film gives us i feel is that um he when he's coming back to the house he has this kind of anger in his face um mm-hmm. that resembles the anger that we see elsewhere so it's it it, to me, it gives the impression of, of a man still railing, still raging. Mm-hmm. But who knows? And this is, I don't know if this is a criticism or not, but the reason I'm bringing this up is not primarily from like a literary concern, but just kind of, um, you know, a frank like acknowledgement that the ending of the film uh, felt like a little muddy for me like there there were some things that i uh, i i i i kind of had hoped would be more clear or at least more distinct dramatically um but um but but for all of that you know it's 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 a great story right and i'm sure that like again i'm sure that right. this isn't an issue when you're reading it but somehow uh experiencing it in this film adaptation form i just uh it was it was like too to uh uh yeah yeah just like i i I just wanted it clarified somewhat Mm -hmm. i do agree i mean i felt a little bit underwhelmed um by you know those the first moments of that last that last act of the film when he's blinding himself and immediately after um it just felt like this sort of abrupt kind of thing and I wasn't, it wasn't, but yeah, I think, I think that the, 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 the line where he says, I ain't got time. And the, for me, the implication being he's this blind man and he's sort of just like laying back and looking up and this kind of that he, he is, he doesn't have time because he is too busy contemplating or yeah. something like yeah, that, yeah. you know? Um, uh, and, and the, the idea that this person, 
I mean, you could, you can, you could, you could imagine a uh, a monk, a desert father, saying exact, exactly like that, exactly something like that when <laughs> if somebody's trying to get them to go, yeah. go do something, and he's like, I don't have time. It's like, well, all you do is just sit there, you know. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That's that's what he should be doing, right? Um. Yeah. yeah. The the. The text does bring us into the thought that, uh, you know, there's there's something that he sees after he blinds himself. You know, and it's only after he blinds himself that he sees it. Um, the um, the dialogue, um, you know, the, the landlady is asking him uh, something. Like she's trying to get at this. She's trying to get at this sideways. She, like she can't just come right out and ask him, you know. I think she does ask him, though, why did you do it? Um, and he says something about, um, you know, if you're... If your eyes don't have any bottom in them, they can hold more, right? Um, oh yeah, no, it's uh, it, it's you know it's directly about like the mystery of death. Um, and she's you know by by being in you know contact with him, she's starting to think more about you know her own death. Like it occurs to her for the first time that after her death, she'll be blind um, because she couldn't imagine why he would ever do this. Um, So she can't come right out and ask him, why did you do this? But she says, you know, do you think Mr. Motes that when you're dead, you're blind? He says, I hope so. And she asks why. Um, So she's trying to get at it. And that's when he says the thing about your eyes having no bottom in them. Right. Um, So, yeah, I mean, (laughs) it's, you know, it's, it's another one of these folded moments, right? Um, you know, what does it mean to be blind in this sense? Um, you know, what it, it's like a multivalent symbol, right? We're trying to mm-hmm. get at, right, this mystery of blindness and vision. And, you know, what is it that his eyes can hold now that they couldn't when he was going through the world and, you know, pulling in all these stimuli and, you know, c- claiming, right, pridefully this ability to perceive more than other people could perceive to the point that he could go out and tell everybody, here's what I see. I see, you know, I've seen the only truth that's worth seeing and I've seen that there's nothing to see, right? Um, and as Holga Joy says in Good Country People, the, you know, that's a kind of salvation, right? That's the nihilist idea. That's what, you know, what he's been promoting. And then the shift away from that, um, yeah, it takes us into a place where we ourselves are not really able to to see exactly what's going on inside of him. And I think that's the way O'Connor wants it. But mm-hmm. I, I feel like we didn't quite get to, um, there's all kinds of stuff in the middle that we kind of missed, right? Like the um, the part with the new Jesus, right? <laughs> um, you know, mm-hmm. Sabbath Lily. Um, as like a kind of pseudo or anti-Mary, there's a lot of other good stuff. Yeah, yeah. that's brought out pretty strongly in the yeah. film. I mean, there's the scene where she comes into the room and she's kind of got this. Um, what would you call it? A head covering. She's of just some lifted kind her sweater and, to like create a kind of shawl. Yeah, she makes this yeah, like... a shawl and and uh, and she's cradling this shrunken man. You know, this kind of mockery of Christ. Yeah, it's quite a striking image. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I and yeah, I mean that is another example of ways in which, like, even if Houston had wanted to avoid like a religious interpretation of the book, um, O'Connor's got such control of the material that he couldn't, you know, he <laughs> had to admit, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I think that this is a great film for Catholic audiences, not just for its, you know, obvious Catholic interest in its themes and in its being uh, based off of a novel from a great uh, contemporary Catholic writer, um, but also um, because of its, you know, dealing with the macabre and grotesque um, and also, uh, you know, yeah, like this, this, I don't want to, I don't want to like, I don't, I don't want to use the term postmodern because I know that has like definite connotations and it has different meanings in philosophical, literary, or cinematic um, circles. But, you know, it just, it just feels like Flannery is definitely the definitive um, rebuttal to a staid um, academicism about how the Catholic artistic tradition works. And at the same time, a like 
uh, a, a prime example of how that tradition can be recapitulated in a new cultural situation. So I think that, you know, for someone who's not familiar with her works, this film does that. Because I'm not super familiar with her writings, um, I've read a couple of the short stories here or there, but but this, you know, to me, it just felt like watching it. I thought, oh man, this is a good one for Catholic audiences to be watching and thinking about because it kind of helps uh, inoculate you against swinging too far in either of these directions. You know, um, uh, kind of like a, a rejection of of what's come before or a flight into it if that makes sense yeah that totally mm. makes sense and, and yeah i mean she's also participating in the the stream of her you know moments secular artistic traditions um you can identify her as a quote-unquote modernist writer which means something different in literary terms than it means in for example philosophical terms um but i think the label can sometimes scare catholics off of a writer like o'connor um because we're so used to thinking oh like modernism like isn't that something we're supposed to avoid isn't that bad right um in you know in philosophical terms it might be in religious terms it might be but in terms of you know, art it, it's just referring to a period I mean, you know it's just referring mm -hmm. to the characteristic um, expression of you know a, a you know a time period right and a, um, a, a way of thinking about you know a, a more stripped down more um, minimal you know more um, like existential way of telling a story rather than the um, you know, the heavily furnished like novels of the Victorian period where you have, you know, all of the details of the physical world are, you know, are rendered in such, you know, granular uh, detail. You have a much more suggested or sketched world um, from O'Connor. Um, but that actually lends itself to adaptation. And I think it's part of why um, it's why, part of why this movie works so well, but why this film works so well. And it's part of why her work continues to be so generative for, um, for other artists, right? For, you know, and uh, it tends, you know, keeps on lending itself to other, uh, other forms. Yeah. Right. And the title of this film is uh, also the name of the publisher who's put out your novel oh, and well, yeah. uh, your collect collection of short stories, right? So there is uh, that, Wise right? Blood, <laughs> yeah, not, not being two separate words, but one word, uh, mm -hmm. Wise bl Blood, um, you know, our listeners, certainly listeners of the Catholic Culture Podcast will be very familiar with those works because they often end up on the Catholic Culture Podcast. But you're also not the only writer, uh, wise blood author who's uh, been on this podcast. For sure. So, yeah, no, yeah, it's right. a, yeah, there's quite a bit of uh, activity around that. So it's awesome to be a part of. Yeah. Right. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks again for coming back on. Katie. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is really fun. <laughs> James, do you want to do a quick newsletter pitch? Oh, yeah. Okay. If you've enjoyed listening to this and you've made it all the way to the end, thank you so much. You're awesome. I'm going to look in the camera for this. You, you are awesome. And you want to keep up to date with everything that we're doing because catholicculture.org does a lot of things. Go to catholicculture.org slash get audio and you can sign up for one of our newsletters and then we will be in touch. All right, everybody. Talk to you later. Criteria is a production of catholicculture.org. Check out our other podcasts, including Way of the Fathers, an early church history podcast hosted by Mike Aquilina, Catholic Culture audiobooks, bringing to life classic Catholic writings, and the Catholic Culture Podcast, an interview show exploring Catholic arts, culture, and issues. You'll find all of this, as well as Catholic news, commentary, liturgical year resources, and much more at catholicculture.org.